Hello, everybody. Welcome to the What Culture Gaming Podcast. I'm your host, Scott Taylor, joined by Ben Roy Turner. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, and Josh Brown. Oi, oi. How are we doing? <laughs> oi, oi, collective Savaloys. Now, I thought we would dive in to the biggest conversation that's going on at the minute in regards to a wider thing that's happening in entertainment, um, which is AT&T doing a big old merger for $43 billion worth of a merger uh, with Discovery. Now, this means that AT&T are selling off part of Warner Media, um, which Warner Media obviously encompassing Warner Brothers Interactive Entertainment, which means that all of their game properties and game studios um, are for now on up for grabs. Um, part of the merger is that some portion of Warner Media will stay with AT&T whereas the rest of it will be sold off but all that stuff is up in the air and we don't know how that's going to affect various projects that are in development or the developers themselves um so this is a big old talking point um to sort of ground it a little bit um the companies that I guess we're going to be focusing in on a little bit are uh, Rocksteady, Netherrealm, you know WB Games, Monolith, Avalanche um those also include games like Gotham Knights, Suicide Squad, Killer Justice League, the next Mortal Kombat, the unannounced Netherrealm game um, which as of this morning seems to be an Avengers versus X-Men game But I guess we'll see if that's even true. Um, And uh, whatever Monolith are doing next, because they've been in weird limbo since Shadow of War. Um, What do you guys think uh, of this whole thing? I do have some more talking points in regards to how much I don't like Warner Brothers influence in video games. (laughs) Mr. JP, what's your thoughts? I think I've thought the same thing that I think every <laughs> single time one of these big acquisitions goes through, and that's why can't these companies just give me a tenner? If they've got $43 billion around <laughs> to spend on gaming spread companies, spread it around. All I'm asking for is two fivers just to buy a couple of pints down the pub. And yet those tight asses refuse to give me any money. But in terms of the actual deal itself, um, it's going to be weird because, you know, we're in this kind of like weird limbo with it. You know, last mm. year there were rumors going around that AT&T were looking to sell off the gaming division. That never happened. Mm-hmm. But it seems like we're back around to that again in this kind of state of, oh, my God, this is one of like the biggest gaming publishers in the world right now with some of the most valuable IP in the world right now, especially in terms of superheroes. Mm -hmm. And we're looking at this future where it might be broken up. It might be sold off to other people. We don't know who's going to stay under the WB Games umbrella with Warner Media or AT&T or whatever. Mm -hmm. And I think the big ease in that sounds a bit um you know reductive to the other companies but i mean in terms of like those people who are working on like the big wbip like you know your rock steadies who are working on suicide squad you've got gotham knights Mm -hmm. i feel like those will stay because they're so intrinsically tied to the wb brand and uh, everything that kind of like comes with that part of it but at the same time what happens with like you know like you said monolith who have kind of been yeah. in this weird purgatory like you said what happens to does nether realm state does mortal combat move you know well, what's like, going on everything that happened with um warner brothers influence on because they for, for the longest time it was like you know 2017 was like let's pass on the baton of hate like the beginning of the eighth generation it was ubisoft making every wrong move like killing ac unity and uh, so many different ubisoft moves microtransactions loot boxes everything else that they were just getting wrong and then 2017 was like every other sort of major publisher learned all the wrong lessons from that and Warner Brothers were one of them like you had orc loot boxes in Shadow of War and you had the microtransactions suddenly in Mortal Kombat and all the loot box grindy stuff that was in MK11 that had to be patched out immediately because it just felt horrible and so I kind of my initial go-to in terms of how this directly affects games is you know there's the whole thing with um the Suicide Squad game the Kill the Justice League which was back and forward you know there was all the Warner Brothers Montreal cancelled game stuff because it seemed like Warner Brothers were still trying to figure out how they were going to do the DCEU when they were Italian games and then the Suicide Squad movie tanks all of a sudden the game was tanked and I just I kind of hope that they can get freed up from that weird corporate swill influence that I feel like has hung over most of these studios um, across the last few years. Like, Monolith haven't done anything since Shadow of War, and I would assume that that's because it's very hard to get a project off the ground when you have number crunches at the top scrutinizing everything. I mean, you know, you've, we, we've seen that, um, like you said, in the terms of Rocksteady and Suicide Squad, we've seen it in terms of Gotham Knights as well, you know, mm. for so many years, there were so many reports coming out about these games that were pitched and then in some cases put in production that were just outright cancelled. Yeah. And I feel like even though the games that WB as a publisher has put out are strong, I always feel like that's kind of in spite of WB as a publisher themselves from the things you were saying there about mm. trying to squeeze in microtransactions and just trying to, you know, squeeze money out of people, not caring about the PC edition of Arkham Knight, for instance. Gosh, and man. it always feels like games like Arkham Knight, games like MK11 um, have kind of come out and fought through all of that sludge and been really great games. But it does make me think about, like you say, what happens if, they go to another publisher like those restrictions perhaps if they are restrictions are freed up that said 
I feel like when it comes to a lot of publishers, we always play the grass is greener on the other side game. <laughs> and it depends entirely on who they get acquired by because they could go to, to a publisher equally as money grubby. As well, that's the kind of the thing, at. isn't it? Like, I mean, they, we don't, like in the UK, we don't have AT&T at all, but they have a rancid reputation over in America, or at least whenever they get yeah. brought up in any conversation, it seems to be, oh God, AT&T. Uh, Mr. Benroy, what's all your thoughts on all this madness? I'm trying to think of the last major game that like Batman was 2015 and then we had Shadow of Mordor was just before that right and then Shadow of War I didn't I didn't even take a look in because of the microtransactions, microtransactions and just why did you drop the Mordor branding like I know I know these people with their uh number charts like oh yeah no Mordor doesn't track but come on and then like <laughs> MK11 I'm always amazed, amazed how big the MK games here, and it's always really? a nice feeling. Yeah, yeah, because you just feel like a fighting game. Uh, you feel like it's got sort of a benchmark, right? Like, because hmm. some people are like I'm not touching the fighting game. I don't like the fighting, but then like so many people play them. Mm -hmm. But then like you think where they could go from here, and if they could be split from. Can you split these studios if you say of any state at all, like from the WB properties like Batman? Because they WB own DC, right? So are they going to let them be as lenient and let them do things they want if they were split mm. away? Or would they shuffle them elsewhere and do a Disney with just like whoever wants it, come and get it and then make a really bad Avengers game? And then like <laughs> again with Neverrealm, can they they cannot be split from Mortal Kombat, right? So then there's the whole thing of like how in tech in, in treated are the rights to the films and can they split them that easily and how much money needs to be thrown away there mm. and then like who would buy them like i can't think of anyone that would be out there to buy them apart from phil Sony. spencer yeah, I was gonna or, say. <laughs> or the embracer group which is gobbly which is slowly emerging from like the dark Tencent, shadow probably. shadow realm and just taking over everyone next to 10 cents so <laughs> who's gonna buy them that's the thing Massive, I don't know, Mass Effect, yeah. Microsoft, man. Microsoft are going to be straight in there. If these things are up for grabs, Ugh. it's absolutely happening. Just because, like you said, Phil Spencer, he's on a spending spree, boys. He's got his online shopping Phil card Spender. up. He's got all okay. Phil Spender. Hey, oh my Phil God. Spender. Um, yeah, he's got his shopping card up. He's got all of these different companies in the basket <laughs> ready to go at the checkout, just waiting for them to come back in stock. Mm -hmm. And I feel like if any of these properties are up for grabs, especially Batman, you know, when these rumors that acquisitions were going to go ahead last year there was a lot of um talk about um microsoft maybe bankrolling a batman game so they have some direct competition mm. against sony spider-man oh, game and you that, feel yeah. like that would be something they absolutely would jump on and they've shown an interest in picking up studios for the past five years or whatever so mm -hmm. to me it would be a no-brainer for them to at least get in the game throw their bags and bags of cash into the ring and be like look we want to do this because i feel like you know even if these studios get sold off to me, it's a no-brainer for WB or at and or Discovery or whoever owns this company now mm -hmm. um, to, you know, license these IPs out for video games. You know, we've seen that, like you said, with um, Disney, we've seen it with Marvel. And it feels like those companies, in a lot of ways, just kind of give up on video game development and say it's too hard, it's not worth the hassle. Mm -hmm. And maybe that's going to be a situation here where yeah. like, the new owners come in, the new shareholders come in and go, why are we spending all of this money when we can just outsource this stuff, license our biggest ips and ultimately do nothing take little risk but then rake in the rewards well, I, that's what disney's doing that's what marvel's doing and that might be the model going forward for these companies that are more than just gaming yeah well the, the thing that infuriates me is that we don't have far more like, use of these franchises like one of my favorite <laughs> movie tie-in games is the mummy demastered it has <laughs> almost nothing to do with the movie other than you know the similar characters there's a fake russell crowe in it oh it might be his face it's pixelated but whatever but that's a very small budget game given to a, a trusted indie style studio and um, who can sort of deliver on it and you get the you get all the there's just so many opportunities for tie-in stuff that doesn't get done that because probably Warner happens do the biggest bets over and over again that probably happened because of a random, e random email that someone just checked up and said to their p personal assistant, yeah, just say yes. And then that <laughs> just sort of slipped through. But like, I I'm also worried about either everyone being like, everyone consolidating at the moment, whether it be films and TV or the Embracer group with launching over mm -hmm. the world as it is. And like, it just, I, it, everything coming together. And like, I'm not one of those, I don't want Microsoft to buy it because PlayStation, I just don't want Microsoft to buy everything because you know no. what, let's all be chill and let's all just, Let's all try and be a bit separate and not be gobbled up into like 
two major corporations when we get to the Tyrell Corporation and the Whaling Use Honey Corporation in the future. <laughs> and we're all just working for one of them growing maggots in a farm somewhere. It kind <laughs> of does, but I mean, like, I mean, yeah, it does feel like a lot of these business moves move towards that. The likes of the Bethesda deal was one of the biggest things ever. Obviously, Microsoft snapping that up. Um, and anything when this stuff sort of comes up, it's like, okay, the future is the future of gaming streaming catalogs or monthly catalogs of titles that can be rotated through. And does it yeah. benefit those companies to lock down as many IPs as possible? Like, will someone like Sony be first in line to try and lock down a potential Warner Brothers property. Um, I forgot about that rumor that you said, Josh, about the the thing from a I don't even know when that was the before times at some point when it was going to be that um, somehow an Xbox exclusive Batman game could come about and that would rival the 2017 Spider Man game. Um, it makes business sense, but I mean, for a healthy creative uh, medium, like there's only so many of these deals you can do before you've gobbled everything up, and then we're just in this weird space. And then there's this weird point that I just need to bring up, like you know, the mm-hmm. Apple versus Epic thing. Like mm-hmm. they're arguing about walled gardens and who can go on there and who can. In a theory, if Epic were to win that fight, then Microsoft could say to PlayStation, "Well, you've got to let us have Game Pass on your system because you can't wall gardens off." And then they, there's all this <laughs> other weird business. The, these are other two titans over here that are going on at the moment, while everyone else is buying each other i'm just i'm scared and lost at the moment i don't know and <laughs> then i heard a rumor that sean Layden was just phil spencer in a, in like a costume at one point so I, now i don't know what's going on anymore <laughs> he's just got a, a lizard mask yeah um yeah i mean that stuff like all the you know where does sony go from here like where whether it's whether it is investing in streaming stuff the likes of xbox the whole thing with game pass to me feels like they're making game pass an app that you just get i mean they've already started doing it you can stream games on, on mobile and everything but yeah, if they, I mean, obviously the, the prevailing rumor is that they'll put Game Pass on Switch um, because Nintendo seem more open to working with Microsoft than Sony. Um, and one of the things that came out of that um, Apple Epic thing was that Sony have all these um, you know, additional fees that they charge for the likes of crossplay in all these different ways that they get their money back. They're not actually playing as fair as they would like to come across um, <clears throat> when the other companies are. Um, but I think all of this is, you know, just sort of like wrap it back around to Warner Brothers. I did find a quote from them from January um, where they literally said in an, in, in an earnings call um, that all their games going forward would have a heavy focus on live service elements. Um, and obviously, like, you know, like I said, you got the Shadow of War loot boxes and everything else. Um, what do you guys think of that? Because st- we're going to potentially move on to uh, the Ubisoft side of things, chiming in on their sort of earnings calls about the future of games being related to free to play stuff. What's your thoughts on this change of the guard, this idea of how you even monetize these projects at all? It's just inevitable at this point, isn't it, man. Like, <laughs> sorry, Ben Roy, I'm just, I have, right. oh, it's just, it's so inevitable. It's just like mm. you look at how much money all of these companies are making from microtransactions, from in-game purchases, from DLC. Like every single time we have this big shareholder meeting with the big publishers, they're just increasing profits year on year through these um different services mm. and the profit from you know premium game sales as they're known just the base sell, sale of a game mm. is shrinking in terms of the entire revenue stream that the company operates on so you know you've got people like wb who have been trying for this future anyway kind of probably looking at those profits and thinking we can do that we can have a bit of this pie mm. and when you've got like people in charge <laughs> like that it's just it's it, when you when you've got like, businessmen at the very high top of these companies there's just no argument that can convince them otherwise (laughs) and that sucks but there's how can you engage in that level to be like look take a hit on your on your bottom line yeah be more creative it's just never going to work and that sucks it sucks that's what that's the uh you know climate we're in Mm -hmm. yeah it's it's weird because or it's not weird because it's just money and you see we get a few (laughs) Uh, games that come out like um, the Screw the Oscars uh, guy that I can't remember his name right now. I'm sorry. Joseph Farris. Yeah, the Joseph Farris. G that is Joseph Farris. With his um, games that somehow slip through the net EA. And again, I feel like that's just a missed email or a Slack message that just <laughs> has somehow allowed him to continue <laughs> to exist. Someone needs to stop Joseph Farris. Because they they make money, but they're not making the money money. And like They're doing it, pretty well, though. Like millions of copies sold. Like he said that EA were very good to him. Yeah, it's, it's not FIFA though. You can't put gambling no. into it, can you? You can't buy like more. But yeah, imagine buying more books or something like that. And it's just, with the it just it wasn't feels like that other the, the other announcement was like a bit delayed, like mm. a year too late. Where I feel like some studios and games were already going back on the sort of live service sort of game issue. So I feel like we're just going in waves where a few studios are going to keep going and then maybe do the turnaround because there are not enough humans with not enough time even with this lockdown and even not like people been at home mm-hmm. to play all these games and keep them alive and it just comes to the point where we'll either have some people where they've seen their line go oh that was wrong 
or oh now nah, that game was just bad and you were just bad at that so we just kill it and that was a bad <laughs> idea when really it either came out at the wrong time where it had so much stuffing shoved into it that it's just they were blown you don't yeah. want too much stuffing if it's I think great it's, stuffing is yeah one of the sort of immediate uh causalities of having something that you need to check in on a daily weekly monthly yearly basis it's tiring then, it's tiring it's exhausting we're not built to juggle 50 different games at once i did quite like um alana pierce's comments on this she said that she was privy to like a um an internal um sort of pitch meeting like pitch deck spreadsheet type thing a few years ago when she was working for ign and the whole idea behind you know constant monetization was this idea of making it fairer for the developers and comparing it to the likes of the movie industry where you have one entry fee for a product and everyone knows that in film you know you pay let's say 10 pounds you get a couple hour film and it's set uh, on in gaming you spend 50 60 pounds and obviously less because the, they depreciate so quickly but you play it for hundreds and hundreds of hours and you can go back to it you can replay it you can do these different things and apparently internally i forget the developer that she cites in one of her in, in her video for this but it was meant to be a way to try and restore some fairness to the amount of time and effort the devs and stuff put in versus the amount that the consumer gets out and i think that side of it is really fascinating because i think it all like you know right now there's very few games that you can cite that get that balance right it feels more like you know they charge you up front for the unit cost and they charge you afterwards i get that for like a multiplayer focused game but like say mm. if i'm playing like resident evil one again for the hundredth time right do i does that mean i have to keep them like keep paying Cap capcom or like so you I, the amount of times i watch aliens for example imagine you right. like taking that to into the, their methodology there of like oh well now you've got to pay a skin if you've like if you've bought the game it's a, it's a weird thing where like imagine getting microtransactions in a film where like oh if you want to hear the plasma rifle again this time that's another <laughs> that's another 10 pence well that's kind it's of like, what like the snyder cut and stuff was let's go back to it and let's do it again or let's like you know the, the batman v superman the uh the extended cut things like yeah, that. yeah but that wasn't that wasn't just like say they, when they, these live service games so that wasn't just like another run was it or no. another which they're all just going to boil down to battle pass and here's now batman with a different skin on it like a different suit right mm -hmm. it's not going to be anything substantial like say like dlc they're not going to some of them might be like but then even this new like season of destiny not a lot of people are liking it because it seems mm -hmm. like they're intentionally killing parts of that game off mm -hmm. so it's all i don't trust it and i think that 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 is warranted in some aspects but like for a lot of them probably not it's just again it's just like well fair turns into not fair we just want more money yeah i think it's i think it's an interesting talking point like just the idea of price points because we have this idea of what a premium price point is yeah and return will obviously 70 pound didn't really go down very well or it seems to be fluctuating anyway um and like that's a whole talking point around that like what should your entry fee be if you're making a 200 hour rpg and should that be the same for a premium eight hour probably game? more i would say if you're making a skyrim compared to like i'm just like a an abe's soul storm right mm -hmm. soul storm you'd expect like you could charge like how much to charge on put on ps plus but like yeah the next Skyrim, whatever sure if it's like 70 or 80 then you could see when you're going to get that much out of it mm -hmm. then i can see it that that's sorry then i can see that's fair in that respect yeah josh what's your thoughts on the idea of i guess the trying to justify ongoing monetization well, I, I used to do it for a long time in the same way. I used to think, well, you know, they're telling us that obviously these games now, especially a live service, when you release it, that's not when development ends. People mm -hmm. are still working on it. People still need to be paid. But I feel like that argument has just been weaponized against us to almost <laughs> guilt us into um, embracing these systems because unless I'm missing so many stories, all mm. of the stories I'm reading, all of, the, all of the news I'm reading points to the opposite. It doesn't point to the developers getting oh, totally. fairer pay, fairer working conditions. It points to, you know, the biggest people in charge, the executives getting these huge bonuses. Mm. And in the case of like, I don't know, Activision Blizzard, for instance, they make record profits every year. And yet we get constant stories about huge layoffs across different yeah. areas of the company. And it's like, they might be coming out because it's very good PR to say, look, you know, these games are really difficult to make and we're supporting them with free content for years and years. You know, this helps us support the developers who work on those games, support the guys at the bottom, you know, at the very entry level of the company. But in reality, I just don't think that's how it actually works. And if you actually look into the stories, um, like the rhetoric isn't supported by where that money actually goes. No, no. So I don't buy it's... into it in that sense. Mm -hmm. Also, like if you say the CEO stuff, like someone like Bobby Kotick getting two, like a $200 million bonus, right? Mm -hmm. That's another game. That could be another few games that you yeah. can fund. Like, like I, I don't care what you say, like one man does not justify that. One needs that, that much money. There's... Yeah, like... <laughs> 
Nothing. Once he, once, no matter, like a million, sure, right? a couple of million, but like two hundred million, when that, that's <laughs> that could be another big budget game, or that could be another two, like mid tier games, or like even be smart with it. Like, you know, mm-hmm. like what Josh said, like the people in the trenches aren't getting any of that, and then a lot of them get been like binned off, and like, and <laughs> in certain times when it's like, what are you doing, man? Like so. It, it, when I see fair and then I see things like that happen and mm. when we don't get other CEOs get their bonuses reported like you imagine like Bobby's getting he's on the the crazy end right but there's got to yeah. be others that are similar and it's just it's, it, it, at the end we're, we're probably I'm probably arguing capitalism now but at the same time it's just like uh, I don't I hate them using the term fair because well, at, I mean, at the end they, of the day all those companies want is them us to be like oh we love you and here's our money yeah which is obviously the most transparent thing ever the um the Alana side of things was um her mentioning a, a video or that them um, the slideshow thing from years ago that's what it was supposed to be this idea that you could monetize the longevity of a game in a way that would benefit the creative team that put it together um obviously that's been completely contorted distorted abused mutated whatever word you want to throw at it to result in the likes of body Bobby codex wage um but yeah to sort of pivot this across into because obviously to roll it back around to Warner Bros to round off that point um do you trust AT&T um or rather a segmented approach to Warner Brothers properties to do right by these things more or do you think I mean because insubitably it can't get any worse like assumedly <laughs> any a bigger selection of devs should lead to more Batman games or something or even a, yeah. a Harry Potter game more than once a year or so, a decade or something I, my friend, have <laughs> been burnt too many times guessing this stuff because I remember oh. when Marvel said the exact same thing and we got Spider-Man, which was awesome. I was like, yes, this model works. License it out. Let us get more of these games from high T developers. <laughs> and that was immediately more or less balanced out with the Avengers. And I'm mm-hmm. like, oh, this just has as many problems as before. I think with anything, whether all of these properties in game developers stay at um, WB, whether or not they're sold off to other companies or something, it's always going to be like case by case. It's always going to depend on who's in charge ultimately. And my um, priorities, I guess, are just Mm. on the teams themselves. Because like I said at the start, like everyone currently at WB more or less is like this really talented group of developers. They have made these amazing games that have resonated with people that have innovated in many ways. You know, look, you look at the nemesis system in shadow mm. of War, so shadow, shadow of Mordor, for instance. Um, and it all feels like it's in spite of, you know, like the, the top down economics of it. But at the same time, you know, I just hope like if they do get sold off, they go to good homes, they're treated well, and hopefully they understand what's happening and they're told that it's not just this massive crisis of, oh my God, this merge is happening. We don't know a thing because mm. that's been the story too many times where like suddenly these careers, suddenly these studios are up in the air and they aren't really informed about the goings-ons of what's I happening guess... to the company they're working with. Yeah, I would hope that the company, the companies going in that acquire the the studios that are up for grabs or the IPs that are up for grabs, um, just realize that they can, they, they'll ultimately make more money putting more Batman games out per every few years or like just whatever. Do more stuff with those IPs. I have to wonder how much it's Warner Brothers going, no, we want to wait and do the big old release every few years, which ultimately just feels stifling. And that inf- innovation was great, right? But then they spend the next five years trying to copyright it so no one else can ever do it. So it was also <laughs> like, true. then just shoot themselves back in the face. And I'm just yeah. like, well, I don't care anymore. You're just going to do that and then like try and segment things off in a way. like. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so it's like a weird attempt at a manufactured sense of pride. It's like, well, we did this mechanic. This is a Warner Brothers mechanic, but it's not thought of that way. It's thought of like you're restricting this from a ton of other games that could have used it. The Nemesis system could have been its own genre, like for the most part. If they'd fleshed it out well enough, you had the sort of chess-like approach to, um, you know, enemy variation and randomly generating bosses. Like that stuff's brilliant. That, sh- that should have been everywhere across the last generation. And it wasn't because they locked it down with a... Um, whatever you call the legal thing. It's not an embargo. Whatever the th- uh, a patent. I think. A patent, yes. The, that's the thing. Gen- general patent. But the Lawyers. thing I was going to bring across um, is the, um, we, we talked a little bit about free-to-play stuff, whether it's the future of the medium, whether or not things like the Warner Brothers merger will lead to more games going down that route. Um, I just wanted to bring in um, some of the comments from uh, Frederick Dugaway. I think that's his name, uh, from Ubisoft. Um, who, there was an earnings call last week where they said that they are looking to build high-end free-to-play games that trend towards AAA ambitions over the long term. Um, and the general sentiment coming out of that earnings meeting was that that would be their way of making games going forward. And they have since responded to the backlash around that, saying that they're not abandoning 
same premium price points altogether. Um, but just ultimately, they do want to explore the likes of, and this isn't their words, but they will be exploring the likes of an Assassin's Creed free-to-play game. They've already said the next division is going to be free-to-play. Um, so what do you guys think of that in terms of Ubisoft do you, properties? Do you know what this means? Go on. Sam Fisher's been rotten in the ground for at least five years, <laughs> oh. and those maggots have been enjoying his corpse because he's never coming back. <laughs> oh, see, I think he will, but they'll do like this stupid free to play one mission every day just thing where you pay for purple goggles. And oh, I didn't think of that. That's Imagine they just looked at Phantom Pain and copied that as Konami was shooting <laughs> themselves in the face. You'd have. Yes. What if all of this Splinter Cell stuff has been building to a. Oh, I. The, the phrase free to play splinter cell with this stupid <laughs> loot box fifth freedom echelon bs i'd rather he stayed dead to be honest let the maggots eat him alive what did josh oh. on this oh man my thoughts that we're just we're stuck in it stuck in a never-ending cycle of game <laughs> develop game publishers making the same decisions every five years you now yeah. we mentioned it when we i think we did the news on it like this feels like something that they get in their head every few years that the mm. future of the industry is free to play and we're going to Think massively to pivot towards them. And, you know, again, there's a lot of um, information and statistics that potentially back that up. You look at the success of Call of Duty Warzone, you look at the mm. success of Fortnite, you look at the success of Warframe, and there are great games in the free to play genre because, of course, there is, you know, nothing in the gaming Pokemon industry Go, genre wise. Like yeah, is totally bad in its entirety. You know, there are even potentially good examples of loot boxes. There are good examples of microtransactions and mm. stuff. But you don't want everything to just be free to play. You don't want that to be your dinner seven days a week, do you? You want, you want to vary <laughs> that stuff up. You want to go to different restaurants. Yeah. You want to have a microwave meal. Let's chuck some of the oven. <laughs> imagine, like, imagine a 10, like a 10 to 12 hour game that you beat and then you could play a few times afterwards and then be done with it. Like, imagine that. Imagine, I know. imagine if something like that came out recently. Like, that'd be a really good one. <laughs> it was a nice return to form. But yeah. I think, yeah, I mean, it's going down the whole. Well, it, it, it does tie into the whole idea, the expectation that you'll be diving in for months and months on end. Um, and that idea of them experimenting with, like, what if the general idea of how we think of games changes? Because um, just personally, whether it's a personal allocation of time or just what I think is best for a creative story or whatever, um, I, I haven't, I'm yet to see a really well-told story across multiple months. Like, you'll get live service games that have spikes of interest, or maybe you do something like a shared universe, like the way Fortnite does big, um, you know, team events or things that you'll see, like, uh, different characters fighting. But they're creating something else like a metaverse yeah. which is now even scary where it's just like these games are becoming vessels for brands to put their brands in mm. so it's just becoming advertisement city we're like i i love seeing like ripley and sarah connor kick some ass with each other but at the same time like well now these are just becoming their own genre in themselves where they're just can we shove uh twinkies in there for example you know what <laughs> i mean like and sorry yeah. to jump in on your point there but like where they're becoming oh this even more minutiae of just this blob of just stuff and just like pop culture thing i like yeah it's like yeah well, i like the... pop culture things i like but not i don't want it in everything and imagine imagine i don't know like spin it itself shut, turn up in fortnite sam fisher in fortnite let's go well he's in the he's in the blooming that mobile thing he's in uh elite squad you can get him in elite squad <laughs> that, that think mess. an operator in rainbow six but they changed his name he's called zero because he's just sort of like yeah that's that's how much he's worth zero has come too <laughs> but it's just that whole yeah, that whole idea of like how do you sort of monetize this IP rather than create a new one? How do you sort of delve back into it and keep it going? Um to flip it entirely, if I just say the term free to play, do you guys have any positive go-to uh games for that? Do you have anything that you play regularly that's free to play? I know Warzone has become free to play, uh Call of Duty. Uh, mine's definitely Pokemon Go. Like I, I've only used microtransactions in that like twice in the last six years, um, or five years. Um, but like are, is there things that you would point to as a, a good version of this model? Oh, <laughs> yeah, I know. I know Warframe always gets back brought up. I've only yes. ever dabbled in that um, when it first hit PlayStation Four. I think it was there for, maybe even at launch. Of the oh, PlayStation it's such 4. a different thing. I can't get away with that yes. game combat, but yeah, that would be a good idea, a good model. Yeah, yeah, like that's obviously you know got its fan base that has by all accounts evolved so much. But the mm. only one that I you know I talk about it all the time, the only one I jump into is Warzone, and I find that even that you know. While it's a successful model, it still it still has a lot of problems in terms of its battle pass and its weapon balancing and how Activision um, and the developers the communicate with the um, fans and stuff and implement updates. They are getting a little bit better, but it's not like it's not a perfect model by any means. It mm -hmm. just happens to be the one that I gravitate towards. Mm -hmm. 
I don't know if you've got anything that comes to mind or is the general idea of like free to play long term monetization something that's just it doesn't belong. I played Fortnite for 85 hours waiting for PUBG. <laughs> I played for PUBG, I deleted Fortnite and never played it again. Uh, there is a game called Enlisted on the PlayStation Store, which I have downloaded because one of my friends. World War II one? Yeah, one of my friends in our group wants to play it and then he forgot about it the other day and we played more PUBG. I just don't don't remember. And then months time we're gonna delete it. But for the most part, I'm gonna say no. I don't I just, maybe it's just me, me only me and the other however many billion of people love them like warzone's fine right but uh maybe if warzone was 20 gigs not a playstation mm -hmm. i would play it more that's a whole uh, other thing if loads more companies go down this route or if we yeah. sort of pioneer this whole thing then they need to sort their file sizes out because yeah. there's no way that this if they more games embrace this stuff we can't start juggling 20 90 yeah. gig games there's rumors of like a PUBG 2 where that would be free to play mm. like of course i would gravitate to that because i've uh, I'm over, I think I'm like 600, 700 hours in PUBG at the moment. So, like, you know, I would I just go to that. 1,000, but yeah. Uh, maybe, maybe if you can do PC. <laughs> but yeah, I, it's not really a model for me. Like, I'm about to jump to the next Gears uh, uh, Battle Pass. I'm just like, oh, God, here we, here we go again. <laughs> they just sort of like, let's, let's do this one more time. And then, mm -hmm. and I'm exhausted with Battle Passes and I've not purchased the pajama party battle pass in PUBG because i don't need to run around in pajamas because i've already got a quite a sick outfit as it is so i i i like a finality to most of my games with maybe two ongoing and mm. i have those two ongoing and i feel like a lot of humans do where like you have your two or maybe three and then that's it yeah well that's the thing that i think is the hardest for in war zone <laughs> 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 mine's just pokemon go and pokemon go but i kind of i just i wonder going forward like if this generation is going to be dogged by these sorts of conversations like these different approaches to price points because i think there it's, it's a valid conversation to have if you can find a way to give us more games more creative ideas for free and you get people on board with them and then that filters across into a premium model then that's cool but i just even then there's not that many games you can point to that have got this stuff right um and i and like josh said it's not like they're not going to nickel and dime you on the on the way to it you're still going to get um as an aggressive price point on the uh, storefront side if they're letting you in for free at least we got exclusives right and we got like what 35 games coming from playstation apparently and then like another yeah. microsoft have like 30 studios themselves or something crazy like that so there's 60 games in the next generation hopefully maybe <laughs> the rest of them they're all they're all dead that's the, yeah that'll be the big split is first party versus third party where it's the the um, budget has already made itself back or the funding is more safe the budget is safe or whatever it's less of a risk on the first party side versus the third parties the likes of ubisoft the likes of warner brothers who will just go hog wild before they get reined in um and it'll uh, it'll be hilarious and tragic in equal measure Adam. remedy are making some games thanks remedy are hopefully making some games but they're making yeah. crossfire x first that weird yeah, but... first person shooter arena thing i do you to pay man. the bills they might be doing Alan Wake 2, so that's good. Everything's good. Oh. Everything's safe. Look, look, look. Alan Wake 2 comes out. There's no way good. There's no, no way Sam Lake gets millions from Epic in a two-game <laughs> deal and doesn't make one of them Alan Wake, especially <laughs> especially after that deal. If that happens, if they don't make an Alan Wake 2 after that DLC, I'm, I'm quitting. I'm going, to, I'm going to refer to that move as as the Fares. I think that if you have access to a big chunk of cash and you just go, no, I'm going to do my thing, and you just yeah. you whap it down, you do whatever idea you want, that's a big old Fares, um, which I want to see more of in the industry. But for now, this has been the World Culture Gaming Podcast. I've been your host, Scott Taylor, for joined by Ben Roy Turner. If you want more of this podcast, please donate to our, I don't know, subscription and 10p and extra will get you another 10 seconds. Yes, that <laughs> probably will happen. Also, Josh Brown. <laughs> Goodbye. <laughs> Catch you next time. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Embrace it. Ten cent it.